Um, ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests, uh, a very good evening. Um, our Chief Executive, uh, Lynn Brindley, is unfortunately not able to be here this evening um, and sends her apologies. Uh, but as the Director of Marketing at the British Library, um, it's my very great pleasure uh, and my privilege uh, to welcome you all here in her stead. Public libraries, I'm sure as you will all agree, sit at the heart of the community and hold a very special place in the minds of people of all ages and social backgrounds. They play a vital role in a democratic society, helping to promote equality of opportunity and intellectual freedom, and they embody a commitment to open access to information and education for all. Investment in libraries produces a rich return. The opening of the new Library of Birmingham building in 2013 will send a very strong and positive signal about the importance of public libraries to the British public. A signal that is much needed in this time of turbulence and reshaping in the sector. The new Library of Birmingham will stand as a beacon, reaffirmation of the important contribution that public libraries make to society supporting not only learning and skills, but also citizenship, community cohesion, business support, and innovation. And Birmingham is not alone, as I'm sure you know, in investing in its libraries. As I prepared for this event, I was delighted to read the headline, Visitors Saw as Borough Invests £4 million in Libraries. It reported, the Evening Standard reported, that Hillingdon Council, which is halfway through a program to rebuild or refurbish all of its 17 libraries, is already seeing a 50% increase in user numbers. The piece in the Standard also carried a picture of the impressive new £14 million Canada Water Library in Southwark, which is due to open in November. <coughs> libraries touch every neighbourhood and every community, providing free access to the world's knowledge. Their work on literacy and with reading groups too often goes unsung. But the habit of reading and learning starts early and extends throughout life. Libraries create and develop a love of reading. They change lives and empower by inspiring people to learn and to develop new skills. In the 21st century, as we know only too well at the British Library, digital services are increasingly important, and that must, I would contend, include a move forward in the lending of e-books. The British Library works very closely with public libraries and seeks to support their agenda in as many ways as we can. Just last week, we met with Tony Durkin and colleagues from the Society of Chief Librarians to discuss how best we can work together to support their priorities. And this is why we at the British Library are especially delighted to host the, the event this evening, the Man Booker Prize event for libraries. And I do very much hope that you enjoy it. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jonathan Taylor and Chairman of the Booker Prize Foundation, and I'm <coughs> delighted to have here with me Ian Fruin, our literary director. And I'd like to add my own very warm welcome. Um, and we're particularly delighted that we have here with us three of our shortlisted authors for this year's uh, Booker Prize. Man Booker Prize for fiction. The Man Booker Prize uh, started 42 years ago. It was just the Booker Prize then. Then, as now, the objective was to get as many people as possible reading literary fiction of the highest quality. To that end, collaboration with libraries has been of huge importance to the prize over many years. And it's perhaps even more important now in these rather troubled times. 
We've been promoting the prize to library users and providing materials to over 1,500 libraries. We sponsor six library writing, uh, reading groups to shadow the judges, to debate the long list and the short list uh, on the Man Booker website, and ultimately decide their own winners. And tonight, for the first time, we're bringing together libraries and three shortlisted authors. Carol Birch, Stephen Kelman, and A.D. Miller, and you will be hearing more from them. Two of the shortlisted authors, who can't be with us tonight, have, however, sent messages, and I'm just going to read them to you. Julian Barnes, who wrote uh, The Sense of an Ending, um, wrote as follows. Like most writers of my generation, I grew up with the weekly exchange of library books and took their pleasures and treasures for granted. The cost of our free public library system is small, its value immense. To diminish and dismantle it would be a kind of national self-mutilation as stupid as it would be wicked. Then, Essie Edugin, uh, author of Half Blood Blues, wrote as follows. Libraries have stood at the center of every community I've lived in. I've moved around a lot as an adult, and libraries remain the hub, the fixed anchor the thing I hold to. As a, a child, I lived for the library, that wonderful and mysterious space my father took us to each Saturday, where we were free to dream of our very best selves. Libraries have been great sources of consolation for me, places where I could find a community of people utterly different from me and yet fundamentally the same. And that, I suppose, is what libraries mean to me, a place where differences meet up with similarities <coughs> and people can encounter their possible lives between the covers of a book. Well, you're going to hear more from the three shortlisted writers we have here. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Tony Durkin, who I think you all know. Tony, over to you. Thank you, uh, thank you Jonathan. It's, uh, as, a, as a public librarian, it, it really is a great pleasure to be invited to an event at the British Library and to be given an opportunity to speak to a, what I believe to be a beautiful national library. And especially to speak at, at an event which is celebrating one of the highlights of our reading calendar, our annual reading program. And, and I suppose if I was to pile on the even more so's, and, and I'm even more delighted um, to introduce our guest man booker authors this evening as part of that. Uh, as a baby librarian in the very late 70s, my, one of my first jobs was to put the booker display up in the community library where I worked. We had a poster, but we didn't always have the books. Um, I can honestly tell you that things have changed since then. Um, and um, before I ask the authors to read, I, I've just got one or two other things to say, if, that, if you could bear with me, please. I particularly want to thank the people who've, who've made an effort to come to this evening's event. There are a number of groups, readers' groups, who have travelled quite a long way to this event, from as far afield as Edinburgh, Swansea, Warwickshire, Coventry and Knowsley. And we've got some special guests from, um, I hope I don't miss anybody out, Redbridge, Calderdale, Swansea, Wandsworth and Knowsley, all of whom are groups shadowing the prize. They're just finishing reading the shortlist and voting for their winner. In fact, two of the groups have already chosen and both voted for Jamrack's Menagerie, so there's no pressure. <laughs> Um, in my own town, Newcastle, we have a Toon Booker event. I'm not quite sure what shape that will take, but we've got people championing, championing all the shortlisted books. 
I, I was asked be before we um, asked the authors to read if I could just say a few words about why the Man Booker is important for public libraries. And uh, I'm going to echo some of what uh, other, uh, Lynn and, and Jonathan were saying about the importance of reading, reading for pleasure, reading from a wide uh, menu of books, reading a mixture of books. And over the last 10 years, we believe we've had a, a whole reimagining of how our libraries promote reading across the country, often in partnership with other organisations, excellent partnerships with the publishers, excellent partnerships with artists, and partnerships with organisations like the Reading Agency, who support a lot of what we try to do. Most library services now have a, a vibrant programme of reading groups, author events, summer events for children during the school holidays, and websites and e-book reading groups. We have an e-book reading group ourselves. And there's huge potential to build on this. And we feel that we've had a really good response from the public. Remarkable, really. We've got 10,000 library-supported reading groups. That doesn't mean, say, that library staff go to all of those. It might be, in some cases, we just provide the material, or we provide the books, or we provide the links uh, to other reading groups. And we get an average attendance now of 70 authors at uh, library reading events, which is pretty good, pretty good indeed. The New Look Reading Service is bringing people into contact with the library as a, as a new venue, really, somewhere where you go for the evening or the afternoon, and a shared space. And uh, if I can just stray into some of the way we're beleaguered at the moment, that doesn't sound to me like a library service in crisis. In spite of the largely negative media that coverage of public libraries, it's worth remembering a few um, what I would call strong positive facts, and I have said these once or twice before, and they're the statistics, statistics that anybody can, can get hold of, really. There are over 4,100 public libraries in the UK, and I still believe that that's a network to die for. There are 321 million visits to public libraries, and there are over 12,000 active borrowers. That's people who use the library regularly, not ones that registered in 1957 and haven't been back in since. 12 million. We may have austerity, I and mean, believe me, we do have austerity like everyone else, but we're working very hard in the public library service to avoid a uniform drabness, to make sure that we cling on to some of the sparkle to see us beyond this austerity period. And our reading work is definitely one of those sparkling jewels. And that's why the Man Booker is so important for us. As I've said, we're really closely working in partnership with other organisations. We're developing a new reading offer with the Reading Agency and we're trying to get everything more integrated. We're passionate about encouraging local, introducing local people to new things to read. We have partners we never thought we had. As Francis was saying, we have new buildings which are excellent venues. We have small community libraries that provide the perfect environment for an intimate reading session and it's brilliant to have the man booker as one of the partners that help us deliver that i could go on it's something that we uh, feel very strongly about um, but but i won't what i'd like to do having made that point now is is uh, in, ask our authors if they would now like to start to give us a, a, a short reading from each of their books and we're starting with carol birch and jan rack's menagerie uh, just give a little context. It's uh, the book is about well, it's about all kinds of things, but it's uh, basically a couple of young boys going to sea, um, and they've worked with wild animals from being children. Uh, but wild animals, when they really get to encounter them, are very different, of course, and they've gone in search of. Uh, a semi-legendary dragon, which is actually a Komodo dragon, but uh, at that time in the mid 19th century, because um, people didn't know it was a Komodo dragon, they thought it was that people had it was the subject of travellers' tales, basically, and nobody really knew. So here is where they see the dragon for the first time. Something huge and dark came out of the scrub twenty yards or so ahead of us, running very fast on four bow legs. It plunged into the high savannah in the direction the deer had gone. We moved forward at a good pace, and all there was was the high grasses on either side of me, whispering at our passage, and the back of Dan's head, and my shoulders hurting, and my breath beginning to scrape a little. 
A good hour of it till we slowed down and closed ranks again. There could be no more talking. We'd come so far now into the island that I'd lost all sense of scale and direction and had no idea which way the ship was or how far away. No idea whether the rock face to our right was the height of two tall men or as high as a mountain. I was never more afraid, but never so brightly aware. I felt as if my eyes were wide and overbright and the others looked the same. Even the Malays, whom I'd considered knowing and unshakable, well I am vulnerable, all but shimmered with an unhinged energy. A dumb show began. Our blood was up. We were in the wild. And the wild has teeth and claws and eyes and a stink like the rotting of a day-old carcass. Dan and the Malays talked with their hands and their shoulders and eyes. The smaller of the two Malays spotted blood. He moved his forearm in such a way how he did it, I don't know, made it look like a deer. Palm towards us, keeping his back, he went forward. For a while he stood absolutely motionless, looking through the thinning bush, then beckoned us cautiously on. I saw the dragon, just above and beyond us, completely still, on a low wrinkle of land overlooking the plain, no more than a deck's length from me. A huge brownish grey thing with black head and legs. Bigger than a tiger, longer and lower, but raising its powerful chest and head as high at the front and trailing behind it a mighty weapon of a tail. It was magnificent. Its feet were like giant hands, splayed and slightly interned, knobbly and wavy, and tipped by long black claws that curved like sickles. A kind of a lizard, obviously, but like nothing I'd ever seen. Thank you, Carla. Now I'd like to ask Stephen Kalman to read a, a, a section from Pigeon English, please. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, Pigeon English uh, follows five months in the life of Harrison Apoku, a recent immigrant from Ghana to a rough council estate in London. Uh, so as we follow his uh, journey through uh, uh, adolescence and as he tells us the story of how he's coming to learn the rules of his new home and, and share those experiences of his exciting new life with us. Uh, at the same time, somebody he knows, uh, another kid has been knifed to death on the high street. And uh, Harry uh, decides, along with his friends, to try and investigate the murder himself. I prayed for the insight so I'd ask the right questions. Dean doesn't believe in it, so I prayed for both the two of us. Dean, can you do one for us not getting our heads kicked in? Me. We'll be all right, don't worry. They won't kill us today. They're too busy getting boozed. It was very risky, but interviewing suspects is all part of the job. If you're going to get scared all the time, then you've got no business being a detective. You should just hand in your badge and go home. The pub smelled like all the beer in the world, even from outside. We tried not to breathe in, in case we got boozed. Dean says it clouds your judgment. Everybody who went in or came out could be the killer. They all looked at us like a hungry vampire. We just stayed by the door. As long as we keep one foot on the pavement, we're safe. Dean. Who are we looking for exactly? Me. I don't know. I think he was black, but I'm not sure. I only saw one hand when he bent down to pick up the knife. It could have been a glove. I was quite far away. Dean. Well, let's start with the black ones then. What about him? Me. No, too tall. Our man was shorter. Dean. Roger that. All right, this one. There was a man by the fruit machine. It doesn't actually give you fruit, it's just a game they play in the pub. You feed the machine some money and it makes all the lights flash. He didn't have any spider webs, but he did have an earring and his eye eyes looked deadly like he wanted to destroy everybody. He was shaking the machine to make the lights come on and swearing. Killers always have a quick temper. Me, could be. What should we ask him? Did you do it? The, don't be a retard, you can't just ask it straight now. You have to try and trap him. Ask him if he knew the victim and just see what his eyes do. If he looks away, it means he's guilty. <laughs> Me. Will you ask him? I'll be back up. D. I'm not asking him. It was your idea. You ask him. Me. I'm not going in there. I'll wait until he comes out. D. I knew you'd do this. I'm not waiting here all day. Me. Go and ask him then. D. In a minute. Let's just see what he does first. Don't let him see you watching him. We want him to act natural. We got back behind the door, peeked through the glass. The killer finished his fruit machine game and bought another glass of beer. 
The other men drank their drinks or texted or just watched the boobs of the lady behind the bar, even if she was old and looked like a scarecrow. <laughs> All the time, the smell of beer was getting in our noses and making us crazy. It gave Dean ants in his pants. When the suspect came out, we had to stop ourselves from running away. You can't show fear. They can smell it like a wasp. Suspect. What's up, lads? You looking for someone? Dean. We're just waiting for my dad. Suspect. You don't want to hang around out here. There's too many arseholes about. It was a trick. He was trying to get rid of us before we gave the game away. He lit a cigarette. Another telltale sign. Me. Did you know the boy who died? Suspect. Do what? Dean. The one who got stabbed. He was his cousin. Suspect. No, I didn't know him. Me. Do you know who did it? Suspect. I wish I did. These fucking kids, they need drowning at birth. <laughs> Dean. How do you know it was a kid who did it? Suspect. It's always kids. You want to stay away from all that shit, boys. It only ends one way. Be smart, yeah? Me. We are. His smoke was going in our eyes. It was another trick to make us blind so we couldn't pick up any clues. <laughs> I'm telling you, they're very clever. In the end, we just had to give up. Dean. They're never going to tell us nothing. As soon as they know they're being interviewed, they just mug us off. We're not going to get anywhere by asking. We have to find out for ourselves. Me. How? Dean. Surveillance and evidence. It's the only way. CSA, CSI style. Fingerprints. DNA. That shit don't lie. I made the thinking face like I knew what he was talking about. Dean's the brains because he's seen all the shows. <laughs> I washed all the beer smell off me before I got home. Mama says a man who smells a beer is a mess waiting to happen. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um, well, Snowdrops is a, a first-person story narrated by Nick Platt, who's a 30-something who's English lawyer living in Moscow during the Russian oil boom. And it tells of the events that happened to him um, over the course of his last winter in that city, specifically after he meets a young woman called Masha on the metro. And the story is framed as a confession to Nick's fiance in London after he comes back from Moscow to, to, his, uh, to his homeland. And I'm going to read the very end of the book, which doesn't contain any spoilers. Um, but I'm, I guess um, my hope is that by the time um, readers get to this point in the book, they might be wondering how guilty Nick really feels about the uh, things that he's confessing to. Um, and also how he really feels about this fiancé woman and what the prospects are for their relationship. The afternoon before I left Russia, the last day of four and a half years that feel like a whole life, I went down to Red Square. I made my way around the boulevard, past the summer cafe and the beer tents to Pushkin Square. Then I walked down to Eskaya and through the underpass beneath the crazy six-lane highway at the bottom. A small crew of die-hard communists with ragged hammer and sickle flags and wild eyebrows were holding a demonstration, trickling in from the, from the direction of the Ferrari showroom and a statue of Marx. There were about 300 riot police, most of them sitting in the funny rickety buses that they always roll up in, a few outside smoking and tapping their truncheons against their shields. I walked up through the gates. In front of me, the make-believe domes of St. Basil's soared above the cobbles. Far above the Aztec mausoleum, the giant stars on the Kremlin towers glowed blood red in the sun. It was high summer, but even then you could sense that the winter was recuperating somewhere across the Moscow River, getting ready for its comeback. You could feel the cold germinating in the warmth. I stood in the middle of the square, tasting the air in the city, until a policeman came over and moved me on. You've wanted to know why I haven't talked to you about Russia. It's partly because it seems so long ago and far away, my old life without a seatbelt, too hard to explain to anyone else too private. I guess maybe that's true of all our lives. Nobody can ever live yours except you, whether you live it in Trisic or Gomorrah, and there's only a limited point in trying to revive it in words. And it's partly that, the way it ended, it seemed best to let it die. I didn't think I could tell you the whole story until now, so I've just kept quiet. 
But it hasn't only been that. Since I'm being honest, or trying to be, since I'm telling you almost everything, I shall tell you the other reason, maybe the main reason. It's up to you what you do about it. Of course, when I think about it, there is guilt. There is some guilt. But most of all, there is loss. That is what really hurts. I miss the toast and the snow. I miss the rush of neon on the boulevard in the middle of the night. I miss Masha. I miss Moscow.
on, on the way here this evening, I was thinking about how, you know, the role that libraries have played in my life, and I suppose actually they've played different and important roles at different stages in my life, and I'm sure that's true of lots of people. And I, I remember when I first really came to love books, I became addicted um, at a slightly less precocious age than Stephen, um, to Agatha Christie books, all of which I took from my local library. And then when I was about sort of 16, 17, and it's hard to believe now, but I had kind of long kind of Byronic hair and considered myself literary. <laughs> and it occurred to me that, um, I guess at about the age of 17, that whilst I had this sort of self-perception, I never really had read anything, any serious books. And I kind of spent a lot of time in my library, you know, taking out Bronte's and Dickens and Hardy and, and ineffectively flirting with girls um, and revising for exams. And then actually I've written another book apart from this book, a, non, a non-fiction book, which I researched um, almost exclusively in libraries, um, in London mainly, and indeed in this library. And I think um, I, I, was, I was writing that book when I went to live in Moscow, and I was saying earlier that had, had, um, had we not gone to live in Russia, um, I think I'd probably be still in Humanities 1, sort of working my way through 1930s social history books. And, um, and now um, my wife and I have got two children, one of whom is three, and we're currently kind of um, working our way through the Mog the Cat back catalogue and the whole Julie Donaldson empire, which we um, get from our local library too. So I guess, I, I think this is probably true of a lot of people and have, have felt this in the last year or so, that if I sort of add up all the different ways in which libraries have been important to me, they've been a, you know, a hugely important part of my life and something that, you know, like others, I've, uh, I guess, taken for granted until it's perhaps almost too late. Yeah. Before we open, open up to questions, I, I wonder if you'd also like an opportunity to just talk about the experience of writing your, your short list of books. We'd just like, because we want to talk about the books as well as, as, um, as the library service. You're looking at me very, very hesitant. <laughs> so I'd like to start now. Okay. Uh, well, it was long and tortuous. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, yes, it was. It was a long, hard slog, uh, but it was also incredibly fulfilling. Um, um, it was a bit like, you know, the monkey on the back that you want to get rid of. It had to kind of. You know, the, the feeling of it was that it, it, it wanted to come out and be written, so I just had to get on and do it. But uh, it, it did it did stress me a lot of the time. You know, some of the, the content is quite uh, emotionally draining, um, so it wasn't always easy to live with. And uh, uh, particularly towards the end, I found myself flagging and having to kind of get a hold of the burst of adrenaline to to kind of get to the end of the, the marathon. So it was quite, well it wasn't, I'm talking about it's 10 years, I'm talking about it was about two years. It wasn't too bad really, but uh, it seemed like 10. <laughs> Did you miss it now you've finished? Um, well no, because I still feel in the thick of it, because I keep having to go around and talk about it. <laughs> 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 it's not really gone away. No, I was trying to start writing another book, um, and then everything kind of went very, you know, Quite big with jam rack, so I, I, I've had to kind of get myself back into the jam rack gear. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Pigeon mm-hmm. yeah. English took all together, I think, about a year to write, and it was uh, an emotional experience for me uh, very mixed emotions. Um, it would be my ambition to be a writer since the age of six, uh, uh, right after I finished Wuthering Heights, probably. <laughs> and uh, uh, for whatever reason, I, I I kind of assumed I would never find the material, I would never find my story or find my voice, and I was on the verge of giving up those pretensions or aspirations and uh, concentrating on the day job. And then uh, the voice of Harrison came to me, and uh, I was very quickly uh, into his life, into his story in such a way that I couldn't possibly imagine uh, not writing the book. Uh, I felt that, that compulsion. And, Along with that comes a responsibility to your characters because uh, you grow to fall in love with them in, in a way and you kind of feel responsible for all the, the mess and the, the trauma that you put them through. So on, on a day-to-day basis I would swing from uh, horror to complete joy in, uh, in what I was uh, uh, making my characters experience. Uh, I, I went along with that. Uh, but it, 
was a, a very uh, emotionally fulfilling time and uh, something that at the end uh, I kind of missed them when I, when I had to, to write that last sentence. Uh, I kind of, I've grown so used to being with those, with those people, those kids, that uh, it was a bit of a wrench to leave them. Uh, but obviously uh, we're into the, the second phase of, of that process where I get to speak to people like you about the book and, and I get to uh, uh, share uh, other people's experiences of having read it. And uh, that has given me a, a, a whole new perspective on, on what I've written. And it's uh, been a very busy time uh, since the announcement, but also a very enjoyable one for that reason. Uh, that's me. Yeah, I mean, I've, uh, this is my first first novel, um, like Stephen, and uh, when I was writing it, I, I wasn't at all sure, A, that I could write a novel, or B, that it would ever, ever be published. And, um, I'd made some sort of forays into trying to write fiction in the form of short stories before, but it always just seemed to come out as a sort of bad pastiche of Martin Amis. Um, and, and this novel came about because, um, as I mentioned, well, as I think I implied, I lived, in, um, lived, I lived in Moscow for three years working as a foreign correspondent. And I think, I think anyone who's got, if, if you have a novel inside you, then I think Russia will sort of find it and liberate it because it's such a sort of stimulating and indeed literary place and the book really came about because of actually because of some research I did about the winter in Moscow in the course of which I discovered this idea of the snowdrop which is a Russian slang term for a corpse that is buried in the snow and comes out in the thaw which I tried to use in the book to mean other things other mm -hmm. kind of to have other kind of psychological kind of symbolic kind of um, <coughs> ramifications too um, so I, I started writing the book um, shortly before I left Moscow, mostly in London thereafter, it, it was it was it was hard. I mean, it was hard because the um, I, I've worked had a, had a I've worked as a journalist for quite a long time, and sort of although I think some of the challenges of writing a book are not that dissimilar from um, those of writing a um, writing journalism, and the main one is actually sustaining the morale of the of the author, um, as, other, as other people have already kind of alluded to. Uh, the, the whole sort of burden and freedom of being able to make things up is obviously new. I know people may think that that's a sort of common habit. <laughs> um, and in particular, my, my book's a first-person story, as I mentioned, and I think I probably naively thought that that was a sort of easy option compared to the kind of omniscience required of third-person narrators, but it turned out to be um, a, a lot harder than I'd expected because of the... Um, the need to convey the things to the reader that the narrator can't see, and also to try to craft a voice that um, is sort of understandable and sympathetic in some way, although I, I think not ultimately likable, and to try to uh, convey to readers that that experience of judging the narrator is, is supposed to be part of the experience of reading the book. And, uh, so that was all difficult, but at the same time, um, fantastically rewarding. I mean, there, when, I think sure that more experienced authors have, know this sensation well, but if, if you get, if you feel you've done something right, even if it's only a short exchange of dialogue or a piece of description, then it, it, you know, it can, it is a very, very rewarding thing. Thank you. So I think it's a good time to open up to questions, actually. We've got a couple of roving microphones, I believe. Um, and if anybody would like to start, just raise your hand, we'll make sure you get a, a microphone to you. We've got a, a gentleman in a blue jumper <coughs> at the back, and then a lady with a turquoise top near the front. Hello. Um, I'd like to ask Carol Birch whether she has ever been around the world yachtswoman or anything like that. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm sorry, I haven't. I haven't. I've been from Swansea to Cork. <laughs> that's, that's as far as I've been on a sea voyage, I'm afraid. And down here, please. Uh, my question is for Stephen. Um, I don't want to spoil the ending or anything for people who haven't already read um, his book, but I just wondered if, when he started it, he knew how it was going to end. Absolutely. 
Oh. Yes. And I won't know my way back from there. Uh, I'm sorry if, uh, <laughs> if you're not too pleased with this. No. Same question to ask Carol. I loved your book. Did you know how it was going to happen? Yeah, well, not, not entirely. I knew basically what was going to happen. I wasn't sure about the loose ends and you know, the actual final bit. But you know, I had to kind of think about that and go away and work on that bit quite concentratedly. More questions? Mm -hmm. Carol, where she did most of her research for her, everywhere I could really. On the, well, a lot, a lot on, on the internet, a lot of reading basically, and through my libraries. I mean, I just went into the library and, and put in book searches and subject searches. And I, I, I'm quite friendly with my local librarians, and uh, they, they know me, so they're very helpful. Um, but they, get, they do a marvelous job of getting me stuff. I'd like to ask Stephen um, about your research as well. How did you research Harrison's, um, all his ideas and beliefs from back home in Africa and what he's learning in London and the mixture and his confusion? How did you uh, uh, research him? Did you know people like him? Or? Uh, there were a few knocking around where, I, where I, <laughs> when I was writing the book, I was still living on that estate. And uh, I lived five minutes walk away from my high school. So. Uh, I could pop to the shops for a loaf of bread and, and catch the kids on their way home from school or their way to school and eavesdrop on those conversations and uh, absorb that, uh, that mode of speech and uh, the banter and the, the, the kind of preoccupations they had. Um, also, the internet is a great resource, lots of reading too. And I think also remembering what I was like as an 11 year old boy is that uh, uh, we do, or at least from my experience, have tend to have a certain way of looking at the world, trying to order things to, to make them uh, conform to the way we want the world to be. We like our lists, we like to draw our diagrams. and Or maybe that's just me, I don't know. <laughs> but um, I, I think I felt an, uh, an affinity to the character which uh, uh, took the place of, of a lot of research. He made a lot of that research kind of unnecessary. I think uh, I had an instinctive feel for him from very early on. Uh, me and Harry are dissimilar in lots of ways, but also alike in a lot of ways. I'm afraid it's Stephen again. Hello. Uh, one or two little points. Uh, I'm not published. I don't. What what I write is blank verse and not not prose. I I read since I was three. Uh, so I'm told. Um, but um, I find that I'm, I'm compelled to write. I can't stop. When it comes, I have to sit down and do it. That's one point. Another point you may be interested in. I was so engrossed and, and absorbed by your book. Now, bear in mind that I'm an elderly lady. When I raised this point at a reading group, I was put down quite firmly by an ex-teacher older than myself when I suggested that this book, with its empathy and its reality and its imagination, should be offered as required reading for a certain age group. She said, oh, well, you might see it like that, but I'm sure it doesn't mean everybody else will which is rather worrying. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, we, they had their stick of the dump. I had my Jane Austen, but so what? They had their stick of the dump. Um, hopefully they'll have Louis Sucker's holes. And I think something else they should have is yours, because it's a wonderful combination of innocence, reality, uh, dawning uh, uh, awareness, Morality, which may or may not be in place, I'm just, I'm, I believe that the expression is gobsmacked. Thank you. Any more questions?
questions? So we've got four, another three after. Any over here? Yeah. One of our reading group questioned the idea of a child narrating a story being as effective as an adult, which two of you have flattened totally. Um, and reading them, you become quite emotionally involved with Jaffa and Harry. Um, you can see what they're coping with. And Jaffa is so accepting of his situation. That is life, isn't it? You know, and then he's got to go out and deal with it. Um, the wanting to go to sea is the big adventure. And then what it brings. Uh, all of that keeps you absolutely on the tips of your toes, I think. And then with Harry, the conflict between his upbringing in Ghana with its strong moral virtues and its uh, religiousness and the, the contact when he speaks on the telephone to his father and his baby sister who just makes noises. I find those two books incredibly powerful and moving and not losing anything from being told from a child's point of view. And it opens our eyes to what children have to cope with. And, and they do. I agree entirely. Thank I you. mean, I do think that this, this is, there are lots of good books that are generated by children. You know, and the idea that a child can't tell the story, you know, life is, is as immediate and real and serious and dangerous to a child as it is to any adult. I don't see a difference, really. You know, I mean, it's getting the voices hard as a novelist, but uh, um, but I, I take your point. I think, I think uh, did, did anybody read um, Keith Waterhouse's um, book? About uh, there is a happy land. Has anyone, has anyone read that? That's a brilliant book, isn't it? You know, it's a, it's a forgotten book. It's a very small book told by a kid, you know, just playing out with his friends and so on. Something very serious is going on in the background that he doesn't understand. Um, and it's the fact that it's told by a child, I think, that makes it so powerful. A child seeing an adult world. Mm -hmm. Can we, can we go to this side? Because we've not, we've not had a question from this side. Then we'll come back to that. I'll address the balance just there. There. Um, a question for all three authors, please. If you had to choose and your book couldn't be included, who would you choose as the winner? <laughs> any of the other books. <laughs> I'm going to wait till after the announcement. Me neither, and that's true. <laughs> Same pop out and free also. <laughs> we have a couple more on this side, and then we've got some more over there. That one there, please. A question for all the authors. What do you believe makes a modern classic? And do you believe that all of your books will become modern classics? That's a bit of a loaded question. You're naughty as well. Uh, I can only go by what I enjoy to read. And I think for me it's something that must engage with uh, modern issues, things that uh, occupy the psyche of everyday people. Uh, and also uh, hopefully something that presents familiar issues, familiar situations in possibly a new way or from a fresh angle. Um, for me, if you combine those two things, you might possibly have the makings of a modern classic and I can't possibly comment on whether I, I see uh, my, myself in that light. Well, if you win the Booker Prize, won't that automatically mean Who from the Man Foundation is here listening to me? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, the truth is, if you uh, persevere with a, uh, writing a novel, you've got to have a certain amount of faith, which you might describe as kind of hubristic, that it's a project worth doing, because otherwise you'd give up. Um, but then, you know, you, uh, but that is a long way from saying that you think your book is a modern classic. Um, and, I, I mean, you, I think you, it's a wonderful thing to be nominated for the Booker Prize. I mean, it's wonderful and surreal. Um, but the truth is that you know you've written the book, 
and it's for other people to judge uh, how good it is and what its afterlife is going to be. It's not um, something as an author that you it's not judgment you're qualified to make. And I think if you use the word classic, that's 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 the judgment of of time really as much as of um, today. So I think you know, for all kinds of reasons we you know we're not well placed to, to ask that question. But I don't think what makes a modern classic is different from what makes a classic classic. Um, Characters facing interesting moral challenges. That's what fiction is typically about. And I think that's true now, just as it was of Dostoevsky or Dickens. I couldn't agree more with what you just said there. I agree totally. And I do think that it's very hard to tell what a modern classic is going to be. That's something that we'll probably not know for 10, 20 years, you know, where that would be. So. Don't know to both questions. <laughs> we have another one or two here, and then a cluster over there. So the, the lady at the front. Hi, this is for Aidy Miller. A sovereign, did you set out to write a noir sort of plot? Did you set out to write a film noir sort of plot? Um, first of all, thank you for the question. Um, <laughs> uh, I didn't really, to be honest. I mean, I suppose. Um, I mean, I'm a little bit surprised that books, been, my books, been described by some people as a thriller because I didn't think of it that way when I was writing it, um, and doesn't have many of the kind of conventional aspects of that genre. Um, I didn't really think of it in terms of genre. I thought of it as a story involving, I mean, the narrator figure, his voice, just as Stephen was saying, was his narrator. I, tried, his, I kind of had his voice in my head, this sort of lonely, slightly drifting, slightly louche, um, 21st century man. And um, I wanted to capture the sort of atmosphere of pre credit crunch, sort of <coughs> gold rush, or black gold rush Moscow and what it did to people who um, encountered it and participated in it. Um, and I suppose, you know, and, and the story really evolved from there, so I, I, um, I wasn't really thinking of it in terms of genre. Um, and I, I guess that the sort of, the, the um, concept of a foreigner in a <coughs> exotic, dangerous city is a sort of, is a kind of noir, um, has a kind of noir feel to it, although I guess my hope is that by the end of my book readers will see that it's not really about um, a, a naive Westerner and corrupt Russians, but it's about the corruptibility of of everyone and of ordinary people given the right kind of circumstances and incentives. Okay, that does come through, but may I just say, when I read the opening, the first thought that went through my head was double indemnity, so that's the question. Okay. <laughs> We've got one other here, that, the lady at the end of the row there, and we'll move across to this side and then come back. I've got another question for A.D. Miller, which is, uh, is Moscow really as sleazy and corrupt <laughs> as you uh, depict it, or did you exaggerate a bit? Um, well, um, this, this is not... This, I guess I'm going to give a two-part answer to that, if I may. That this book is not an encyclopedia of Russia, or even of Moscow. It's a view of Moscow, a particular slice of Moscow at a particular time, which I've just described. It's kind of mid-noughties, the time of kind of maximum sort of reciprocal corruption between um, uh, Western banker, bankers and lawyers and people who were supposed to be asking questions about the money they were lending and the deals they were doing and often weren't. And it's new Russian businessmen who, in some cases, were no more were no more savoury, and so that's the milieu in which my narrator moves. It's not a portrait of Russia, but altogether, nor even of all of Moscow. Um, and like all first-person narration, it's as much about the narrator as it is about as it is about the events that he describes. But having said that, um, Russia is a very corrupt country. Um, it's according to people who monitor these things, it's one of the most corrupt countries in the world. And the kinds of crime that happen in my book 
and exploitation of vulnerable people that happens in my book happens all the time in Russia. In Moscow it happens every week. Um, and you know, it is a place where vulnerable people, like some of the characters in my book, who lack powerful connections, can find themselves very quickly in very deep um, trouble. Um, so uh, I wouldn't like anybody to read my book as a as a as a as a description of Russia as a whole. But it is it is sadly and undeniably the case that it is a very corrupt and criminalised country whose victims are overwhelmingly, of course, Russians. We have a cluster of questions over here. If we could move across here to the far end. Questions um, provoked by um, Stephen's novel, but any of you might like to answer it. There's a lot of evidence that links literacy with success, and my question is: um, Do you think the novel, in its traditional format, is relevant to kids like Harry? And if it is, how do we get them to engage with it? The novel in its traditional format being paper, <laughs> cardboard. Yeah, it's always going to be relevant. I think. Um, e-books, Kindle, that kind of stuff is just going to increase the chances of kids getting hold of literature. But um, this uh, lovely format here is always going to stay relevant. And I think it's just a case of um, encouraging those kids as much as we can. And there is a, a certain element of chance involved in that, unfortunately. It could be that uh, kids don't get that encouragement from home, but they get it from a teacher at school. Or it could be that uh, um, a child... Uh, doesn't have any other outlet, he doesn't have his sport, he doesn't have his music, but he has a love of literature. It could be that uh, an only child is more likely to uh, go, go off and read on their own than, than a kid who has lots of siblings to, to uh, run around with. Um, so there's an element of chance in there, but I think the role of libraries and the role of uh, teachers at school is just to engage kids uh, uh, with the idea of reading for fun rather than just as a chore that needs to be, needs to be done for, for school. And uh, there are lots of uh, competing uh, sources of entertainment out there, but the book will always have its place. Anybody else want to talk? Well, yeah, I, I, I suppose as a, as a father of a young, you know, young children, a, young, a three-year-old child, it's, it becomes, I mean, all parents must have this experience, although it seems like a revelation when it happens to you, that you realise what innate thing the enjoyment of stories and the telling of stories are. That children love stories and they, quite soon after they can listen to stories, they begin making up stories. But, I mean, I find it hard to believe that there won't always be a place for stories and for novels in children's lives and ed education. And actually, I think I'm a dead, dead tree person too. I mean, I'm on the wrong, just the wrong side of that digital divide, whatever it's called. But I do think that technology and, you know, Kindles and whatever comes after Kindles are going to be a good thing for, for ultimately for, for broadening readership and enabling people to read in, in different ways. So I, I'm optimistic about it. Yes, I, I mean I don't I don't see the electronic uh, book as a bad thing at all. I think you know it's still it's still words, it's still stories, um, and if it's reaching people, I think that that's that's what we need. I I also love to just have a book in my hands, but uh, it needn't necessarily be the only way of, of getting those stories into people, so other, other things have, also have their place and are very valuable, I think. Someone you know, behind, in front of behind, sorry, you've got a microphone, sorry. Hi, this is a question for all three um, of you. When the shortlist was first announced, I think there was a bit of carping from some critics that, that this shortlist was somehow too readable, as if that was, <laughs> as if that was a bad thing. <laughs> I think I read that awful phrase, dumbing down. I just wondered what you thought of that criticism. It's difficult to say because I've not read the shortlist, so um, <clears throat> which I know of it, it doesn't seem like dumbing down, but um, I don't want to comment too much because I haven't read the books. Uh, nor have I, but um, uh, as a general point, I don't think uh, it's a bad thing to uh, uh, encourage people to read and to make literature uh, as a concept. Uh, mm -hmm a bit less elusive and a bit more accessible. 
Um, I, I think if they're bemoaning the fact that uh, there are some books here that may have plots uh, and may have <laughs> may have a, a page turning pace to them, then uh, uh, I think they're barking up the wrong tree. Well, not only have we not read um, the books on the shortest, but it strikes me that many of the people doing the carping haven't read them either. Actually. <laughs> and, and actually, I mean, you, you, know, you, se you send your book out into the world and you, you sort of have to be ready for the fact that people can say whatever they like about it. And that's fine, and that's part of the sort of deal, but it is a, it's a little bit irksome when you see your, I mean, I've, 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 I've seen my book described in all kinds of ways which betray the fact that the person doing the describing hasn't read it. I mean, I think it was described as a Soviet spy yarn somewhere. <laughs> so another review confidently opened, uh, confidently stated that it opened with the discovery of six fingerless corpses, which it doesn't. Um, <laughs> so I, I guess um, I guess you take it with a pinch of salt. But at the same time, I think this it seems to me, from a kind of um, non scientific way, that we've been here before with this route about the book of shortlist and readability and and populism and so on, it seems quite familiar to me, so I don't think it's new. But I don't think that, as I said earlier, I mean, you know, it's not for us to judge, really, the quality of our book or their merit is, fortunately, somebody else's job. Um, question for A.D. Miller. Are there any plans for your book to be translated into Russian? Um, and how do you feel about somebody else taking on the sort of writer's voice? Because we've read a few translations recently and we've had quite a lot of discussion about how much that impacts on the quality of the writing. Well, I'm pleased to say it is going to be in Russian, actually. Um, which um, um, a, a Russian um, publisher has just um, kind of taken, taken the Russian rights to the book quite, quite recently, which I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased about. It's going to be in Quite a, few, quite a few languages, in fact, but very pleased it's going to be in Russian. I think there was some um, scepticism amongst Russian publishers about whether there was a market in Russia for a book by by foreign about or set in Russia, which I can understand. Um, although I, don't, I mean, my experience of Russians who've read the book is that they haven't complained that it's an overly bleak portrait of their country. In fact, I think I have seen that criticism, but it's, it hasn't been from Russians. It's been from from, people, from, from, Brit, from British people and others. I mean, as to the, the voice of the narrator in a different language, um, I guess I'll find out. I'll do my best to, to judge it when it appears. My Russian is sort of a bit rusty, but I'll try to sort of... Uh, I mean, I, I'm thrilled that other people in other countries are going to read this book, and um, in almost every case, I'm not very well qualified to judge the translation, so I have to take them on faith. And unless I'm mistaken, there was one more question over here somewhere, yes, if you put your arm up again, really. There's a question for Stephen, please. I loved your book, I really loved your book, but um, the pigeon, the pigeon is strange and wonderful and beautiful and many things. But I'm not quite sure that I got it, and I wondered if you could say anything more about what was behind the pigeon. Uh, first of all, I don't mind at all that you didn't get it. Um, uh, I think it was just uh, one of those little ideas of mine that I was trying out, and if it works for some people and not for others, that's fine. But uh, I think the, the main thing behind this pigeon was that Harry, he's 11 years old, he's at a pivotal time in his life where he's facing a lot of challenges uh, and he doesn't have his father around to, to help him, guide him through those challenges. He has the odd phone call home and that's pretty much it. Uh, he also has a vivid, a vivid imagination as we know. Uh, so uh, he befriends this pigeon uh, and they uh, commune uh, and whether that uh, relationship is going on in Harry's imagination or not, that's for, for you as the reader to decide. But uh, I wanted uh, I wanted him to have a friend, I wanted Harry to have a father figure and uh, somebody who uh, uh, is on his side. Uh, the pigeon, uh, I think, uh, represents that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one more there. Sorry, I think, can I just, sorry, I think we'll probably have time for two, three more questions, including the one that we're I just wanted to ask Stephen, um, had he ever read any of the Jennings books? Uh, 
No, could no. you explain those to me? Um, it's Anthony Buckbridge. It's, it's about two boys who are about 11 years old and it's all their, their thoughts and it reminded me right. a bit of Harry, the way he thought as well. And I just wondered if you'd ever read any of his. I haven't, but yeah. if uh, okay. it reminds you of those, then I, I'm, I'm very gratified. Okay. Okay. I've got something to look forward to. get it from your library. Yeah. 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 I'll go and seek those out. All three of you, um, I wanted to tell you that in our library group, in our reading group, we've been struggling in the last few weeks to read all your books. Why haven't you read each other's books? <laughs> <laughs> it's just having that the time. Um, I'd like to be able to read and enjoy all of those books uh, after all the fuss and hoo-ha of the man book has uh, been and gone, so I can uh, enjoy them on a personal level rather than... Uh, uh, with any other agenda in place. Uh, and also I'm terrified of uh, reading any of them and realising just how better they are than mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and the lady over here. Yes, can you tell me, is it harder to write a good short story or a normal length story, novel, what have you? don't write short stories, so I'm not the person to ask about this. I have written short stories, but I've only really written one that I've ever been happy with. And that's not a good record, really. So I, I'll pass on the short story. Um, yeah, similar here. I, I wrote one short story when I was 16 that was published, and I read it recently, and it was rubbish. <laughs> I've only written one novel and a couple of short stories, neither of which have been published, so um, I'm not very well qualified to say, other than that I think that the same difficulties uh, are right. I think in, um, you know, the beginning of a story is hard and the ending is hard, the structure is hard, lots of, you know, I think, the I think, I suspect, maybe I'll find out if I have a, you know, have a career as a, as a fiction writer, I suspect that the same things are difficult in both formats. I do think it's quite a different skill, actually, though, as well. I, I think, you know, there are a lot of, you know, some people are great short story writers, um, brilliant short story writers, but they don't, they, you know, they're not, they don't really even want to write a novel, and I think that's fine. But I think there's a lot of pressure on short story writers to come out with the novel, as if it has to be. Um, whereas I think the short story is quite an undervalued form and a great skill in itself. Now, now, unless there's anybody who won't sleep tonight because they've not had the chance to ask their pressing question, I'd like to... Oh, are you sure you wouldn't sleep? Uh, is this, is this, is this uh, an antidote to insomnia? I just wanted to ask Stephen if you could define Hucius. Uh, Hucius is a Ghanaian English slang term. It means frightening or scary. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, you can clap. We're, we're about to wind up now uh, after some thanks, and then our three authors will all be um, moving through there. You will be able to buy copies of the books if you wish. You can get the authors to sign uh, copies of the books if you wish. We'll, we'll sort that out in just a moment. It's just my job now to, to give a few thank yous, obviously to our three authors, to wish them equal luck with the other three authors <laughs> over the next uh, period. I thought it was quite an interesting programme I heard on the radio at the weekend that, um, it, well, if you're a first-time novelist and you're shortlisted for the man booker, it's probably not good for you. So I hope you don't be too disappointed to have been shortlisted. That was sort of turning, uh, turning something very positive into less, less so. Uh, I'd like to thank the British Library for hosting the event tonight, for Man Booker, for their support and organisation. For SILIP, which you might not know what SILIP is, but SILIP is the Chartered Institute of Library and Information Professionals. It's the library's, the library's professional body, and for their role in helping to support tonight. To our authors, as I said, and especially to our very well-informed audience, um, who have demonstrated that they have read the books. <laughs> um, along with the librarians, we've all read the books. We've not been to bed for weeks trying to read these books for tonight. Um, and thank you very much. I, I just want to say something really. I, I made a sort of glib comment at the beginning about when I was a baby librarian and we would put the book up um, display. 
We hardly ever had author visits in those days. It was rare to meet an author, particularly if you were, uh, well, I would say provincial, but I think it's supposed, to, but it's supposed to say regional these days, if you weren't in London. And it was a real struggle. You know, on the rare occasions you got an author, it was really special. And, and, and um, ordinary readers and children never had the opportunity to talk to someone who'd written something they'd enjoyed. And that has changed completely. And, and it, I think it demonstrates tonight how important that is for readers to be able to engage with their authors. And it, it's a really great development uh, since that period. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I hope you buy lots of books and have them signed. Have a safe journey home, and thank you again for our authors.